Hey super friends, my name is Neil and welcome to this episode 90 of the Get Your Comic Con podcast. We're here fortnightly-ish to bring you a slice of film, TV and pop culture goodness from our studio direct to your speakers. I'm flying solo this episode, but James will be dropping in a little later on with a very special interview celebrating the release of a brand new DC Comics animated movie which is available in stores from this week. I'm also going to be wrapping up my thoughts on the final episodes of the final season of Star Trek Picard, which I am currently in mourning for now that it is off the air. I've also got a heap of recommendations for you. I've got comic books, I've got TV shows, I've got movies, I've got everything that I want to recommend to you at this moment for you to consume. But before we do all of that, why don't we cover off a little bit of what is going on in the news right now. First up in the news this week, Warner Brothers UK has confirmed that Shazam! Fury of the Gods will be coming to pay video on demand digital services from April the 28th. It is already available in the US, so this is the UK home video digital premiere. It includes a whole bunch of new featurettes and special features. So there is Shazam! Let's Make a Sequel featurette, the Rock of Eternity decked out featurette, the Shazam! Lee reunion, the Zack effect, the Sisterhood of the Daughters of Atlas, pay-by-play scene breakdown, and then there are a bunch of scene-specific, uh, I guess, uh, like closer looks. So you've got the Ben Franklin Bridge Collapse, the Rooftop Battle of the Gods, Unicorn Ride in Philadelphia, Epic Showdown at the Baseball Stadium, there's the Mythology of Shazam feature, an audio commentary with director David Sandberg, and deleted alternate and extended scenes. We don't have a date for when this is going to hit Blu-ray and DVD yet, but the premium digital ownership does begin from April the 28th, 2023. So grab your copy, grab the popcorn, get the family around and watch that this weekend on the sofa because that's going to be a fun one to to watch with all the family. There's also been plenty of Star Trek news in recent weeks. So in case you missed it, first up there was an announcement that Michelle Yeoh, sorry, I should say Academy Award winning Michelle Yeoh, is returning to Star Trek as Emperor Philippa Giorgio for a very special Section 31 TV event movie. So Section 31 had originally been envisioned as a series and was first announced back in, I think, 2019, but it is now going to be an event movie which will begin production later this year for release next year that will focus on uh, Emperor Georgiou, because Captain Georgiou, as you will remember, died very early in Season 1 of Discovery and was replaced by her alternate universe counterpart. It will follow her and her Section 31 crew as they deal with some kind of universe looming threat. And Paramount Plus has also released the first teaser trailer for Season 2 of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. That show returns on June the 15th on Paramount Plus in the US, UK, Australia, Latin America, Brazil, France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland and Austria. Other countries where Paramount Plus is available are yet to confirm a premiere date. The trailer shows a little bit more of James Kirk who is joining the cast this season, although we don't know how big his role will be and how many episodes will be him, but this certainly looks like it's going to be another incredibly fun season from the crew of the USS Enterprise. Don't forget that this season also features a crossover with Lower Decks where Tony Newsom and Jack Quaid will appear in live action as uh, Mariner and Boimler. There's no footage of that in the trailer, but certainly uh, I can't wait to see that. And I'm so glad that Paramount is now releasing episodes on the same day. So uh, as you just heard, it's returning on June the 15th. It used to be that episodes would air in the US on Thursday and in the UK on Friday, but now Star Trek will align itself and it will be a global Thursday release. So that is very, very exciting. If you have not seen the trailer yet, you can check it out over on our website, which is www.getyourcomicon.co.uk. DC has announced a brand new series, which is definitely going to please fans who are mourning the upcoming loss of Titans on HBO Max. They have announced that spinning out from uh, Dark Crisis, with the Justice League no more and the dawn of DC now upon us, the Titans have stepped up to become the DC Universe's premier superhero team, and all eyes are on them. But who are Starfire, Raven, Donna Troy and Beast Boy? Where do they come from? What do they stand for? All will be revealed in this brand new series, Tales of the Titans. It's a series of spotlight issues in the spirit of the 1980s classic Tales of the New Teen Titans. Uh, The first issue is written by Shannon Hale and Dean Hale and has art by Javier Rodriguez. And it will be releasing in comic book stores on July the 18th. 
it will put the spotlight on Starfire, alien princess and warrior. Her huge heart, huger hair, and fiery fists have made Starfire a fan favourite member of the team. When a spaceship bearing Tamaranian markings crash lands on Earth, Starfire goes on a solo mission to uncover its origins. But what awaits her on that journey will bring her back to the earliest days of her youth, to memories of two sisters eternally at war, and perhaps the chance to keep history from repeating itself. The second issue will release in August and will explore Raven's backstory. That one's written by Teeny Howard with art by Eleonora Callini. Uh, the third issue, which will arrive on September the 26th, will look at Wonder Girl, Donna Troy, and that comes from Steve Orlando and artist Kath Lobo. And then Tales of the Titans number four will hit stores on October the 24th and will look at Beast Boy. Uh, that one's written by Andrew Constant and has art by Brant and Steen. How amazing is that uh so the series will have uh, covers from artist nicola scott and you can check out all of the cover art over on our website there's going to be a cool way at looking at some of the uh kind of i guess i don't want to say lesser known because that's not fair but basically looking at members of the of the team who aren't cyborg or kid flash or nightwing for instance who maybe casual fans don't know quite as much about so that's going to be really really cool and that's launching in july so hopefully there'll be a big splash for that at San Diego Comic-Con, which leads me into our final news story for this week. As you know, this year is 10 years of Get Your Comic-Con, the website. And uh, what you might not know is uh, part of our origin story. So uh, 10 years ago, Boy Wonder and I, well, 11 years ago, sorry, this year, uh, Boy Wonder and I got married and we decided that for our honeymoon we wanted to go to San Diego and go to San Diego Comic Con because neither of us had been. We booked all of the holiday and then failed to get tickets to San Diego Comic Con, but we went and had an amazing holiday, saw lots of the stuff that you can do outside the convention center that doesn't require a ticket, looked in through the doors and were very sad that we couldn't go in. And then uh, San Diego happens around my birthday, uh, and that year it was slightly before, so we got back to London and we were hanging out with some of my uni friends for my birthday and uh, basically it came up with um, in conversation that it was like start a website, start a blog, start whatever you want to call it and see if you can get yourself a press pass, uh, see if you can do it in the next 10 years. This year is year 10, this is the first year that I have applied, uh, obviously San Diego has not been happening for the last couple of years. Uh, what well, did last year, but uh, prior to that had been off for a couple of years due to the pandemic. Um, but I have applied and been accepted. So we are going to San Diego Comic Con this year. The flights and hotels are booked. It is happening. We are attending SDCC as press. Not only that, we are doing it on the 10th anniversary of the website and also in the week of the 100th edition of this very podcast. So coming up this July, you will have coverage from San Diego Comic-Con, from the show floor, from panels, hopefully interviews. We'll be celebrating 10 years of Geico. There are big plans that I need to tell you about, but we'll do that in the near future. But you will also be getting the 100th podcast live from San Diego. So that is very, very exciting. And I thank each and every one of you uh, who has listened to a podcast, read a review, been on the website, liked a social media post, because... Uh, yeah, we are just so grateful that you are out there and that you enjoy what it is that we do. So get ready. It's only really a couple of months away, uh, three months away, I guess. Um, so I need to probably get the suitcase out and start planning what I'm going to do. That's all for the news this week. Don't forget, if you want to keep up to date with all the latest news from film, TV, pop culture, comic books, head to our website, which is www.getyourcomicon.co.uk and follow us on social media. We're on all major platforms at Get Your Comic Con. Releasing this week on Blu-ray, DVD and on digital, the heroes of DC's Justice League and Rooster Teeth Animation's Ruby join forces to battle an evil entity attacking Remnant in Justice League First, I don't. What do you say when it's an X? Justice League and Ruby, superheroes and Huntsman Part One. The all-new feature-length DC animated movie finds Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Cyborg, Green Lantern, and Vixen in new iterations, transformed into teenagers while on transport to Ruby's world and presented in Rooster Teeth's anime-influenced animation. Partnering with the heroes of Remnant, Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang. 
to battle a mysterious and superpowered creature before it destroys everything we know. The film features a really cool voice cast. So DC's Trinity are now taken over by Natalie Allen Lind uh, from Big Sky, The Goldbergs and Gotham as Wonder Woman. Chandler Riggs from The Walking Dead, who you will hear in an interview with James shortly as Superman. And Nat Wolf from The Fault in Our Stars as Batman. They'll be joined by Ruby's long-running cast, Lindsay Jones as Ruby, Kara Abel as Weiss, Aaron Zeck as Blake, and Barbara Dunkelman as Yang. Now, if, like me, you're not completely familiar with Ruby, it was created in 2013 by the late Monty Oham, who is uh, also known for Red vs. Blue, as an animated web series. It's now one of Rooster Teeth's most beloved, viewed, and shared franchises, with the ninth volume of the series having premiered earlier this month exclusively on Crunchyroll, alongside all previous volumes. The film was produced and directed by Kerry Shawcross from the Ruby franchise and is written by screenwriter Megan Fitzmartin, who you will uh, know that we spoke to on this podcast a few months ago for the uh, Legion of Superheroes movie. Producers are Ethan Spaulding, Jim Krieg and Kimberly S. Maru. Laurie Yates is supervising producer and executive producer is Michael Uslan, who you will know from the Bat franchise. Sam Register is also an executive producer. And as I said, you can grab your copy on DVD, Blu-ray and digital in the UK now. I haven't had a chance to see this movie yet, but I have obviously watched the trailer a little bit. I'm trying to familiarise myself with the characters from Ruby, so it makes a bit more sense. The animation looks really alien to me, but very cool at the same time. The character designs are really interesting. They do have a great anime flair. So I think Martin, uh, sorry, Boy Wonder, will probably quite enjoy this film because it really digs into some of the anime stuff that he loves. But when it comes to anime and the potential for interviews as well as review, I thought there's one man for the job, and that is James. So he will be tackling uh, a review of the film, which will be up on the website probably by the time this podcast releases. And he also got to sit down with Chandler Riggs, the actor who, as I said, is voicing Superman, Clark Kent, in this film, and is widely known in pop culture for the role of Carl in The Walking Dead. So why don't we have a little listen to their chat? How you doing? Very nice to meet you. Oh, great to meet you too. It's um, it's awesome talking to you. As a, a big fan of The Walking Dead, this is um, yeah, this is a highlight of the year so far. So thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk with me. Oh, dude, that's so great to hear. Absolutely, yeah, I'm happy to. And um, before we get started, just wanted to say a a, a big welcome to the DC universe. Uh, this this must be really really exciting for you. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is absolutely like a it's, it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. It's um it, it, one of the most like surreal things that has happened to me in the last hour many years. It's just so so cool to have an opportunity like this and um to get to you know join yeah join the join the DC family and the anime community too. It's like it's such a crazy blend of worlds and and I'm I'm. I'm so lucky to be a part of it. I was writing down questions and I was contemplating whether to speak about anime because I never know if people are into anime. I'm a huge anime fan and I I didn't want to just assume, um, but you're an anime fan? Yes, yeah, yeah. My um, I, I was kind of uh, like off and on for a little while, but my girlfriend is super big into it and so... She's got me hooked on on all of the big the big shows right now, so yes, I am an anime fan for sure. That is awesome. That makes me very very happy. Um, what what are yeah. you watching at the moment? So, um, oh man, well we we love Demon Slayer, Chainsaw Man. Um, we we're still trying to get caught up on on Attack on Titan, it's kind of on the on the back burner right right now, but. Um, uh, Man. Right now, actually, her favorite is Land of the Lustrous, so we're watching through that. Um, and oh gosh, what else? We have so much that's like on our on our backlog of, of things to watch. But um, yeah, I try to I try to at least like keep up with like the mainstream stuff in anime because it's uh, it's such an it's just a cool you know um, medium to tell stories and oh and we just we just watched Susan May. Oh, yeah, fantastic! Really yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. It's it's just it's it's so surreal to think that I'll I'll uh, I'll be a part of the, like that community now. It's so cool. 
that's that's amazing and um yeah like you said you're you're now part of the anime community you're also part of the dc community and uh, not just that it's uh your first kind of dc role is superman um what was that kind of conversation like oh, it's, it's just so surreal and so crazy i remember i got the email and i was like did you guys send this to the to the right client here like is this, are you sure? like, this is uh for me and uh yeah yeah it was just like so so surreal did um and i was a huge fan of rooster teeth as well i had watched all nine seasons i've all of them on dvd of red versus blue so um getting to like come back and, and work with those guys it, it felt like just very full circle and um yeah and and i i was i remember talking to to carrie i think either on the when we were recording or around the time we were recording and they were just casually throwing around the names like oh yeah wonder woman is doing this and batman is whatever the flash I'm like guys this is crazy you know that right like to be like just throwing around those names like it's nothing it's just like so surreal to me and uh they were like yeah we we know we've been on this it's like it's been crazy for us too in meetings having that having these names thrown around it's just crazy that's awesome and um obviously this is kind of like your first major voice acting role and um what was that experience like kind of recording your lines being in that booth you know um did you adjust to it okay yeah yeah you know um i i, I really I, i've been doing a lot of you know studying with on acting and everything just in, just a ton of classes over the last two years so i was really able to take everything that i've learned and apply it to this and um they they actually liked my neutral voice a lot for super for this you know version of superman so i didn't really have to um I didn't have to do a, a ton of like change with my, my vocal you know range or change the sound of my voice, but I still had to like reverse engineer this character, and it's it's uh, such a unique and complex character. It's an adult Superman that's in a young body that has hormones and and this like awkwardness that's like thrown into it. That's you know um, it has to be in line with the Superman that people know and love. And how over how many decades of, of you know media, so um, it was a really interesting challenge to to tackle, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head there. Um, kind of um, the thing that I loved about this version of Superman is that you know he was still he's young at heart, but there's still that kind of like defining strength and presence. And I think you did such a good job of bringing that in, but also the innocence of being uh, kind of like a teenager. I was just wondering, um, did you look to any other iterations of of Superman for you know inspiration? You know, the the character of Superman, I feel like it's so like ingrained in everybody's minds that it, it, I didn't really have to go and do a ton of research. Luckily, I had um, my my coaches and everything that I was collaborating with to help kind of bring the character to life. But um, I definitely i i took a hard good look at the current you know um or at least over the last how many years of, of um animated justice league superman because that's the character that i'm you know that people are kind of, kind of expecting is justice league's superman the animated version so um that was kind of how i i reverse engineered the character and, and built him off of so um yeah that's kind of where i where i look to inspiration but you know again he's such an iconic character that people know inside and out so i really had to bring um bring all of that weight to this character so but it sounds like it paid off and i'm i'm so glad to hear that um yeah it was i had such a good time watching it and i'm kind of somewhat new to the uh, kind of the ruby fan base and that world so it was a really nice introduction and a continuation of that and i really loved just absorbing it all in and especially as like a, a comic book fan what i've kind of come to realize is that the great thing about these characters is that you can kind of come into contact with them um at any point in your lives through different mediums whether that's comics um animated shows tv films and even games so I was just wondering, yeah. um, 
what was your first interaction with the DC universe? Oh man. Um, my first. Oh man, I, I had I have had to have been so so young. You know, actually, I think my dad had a bunch of like original like Green Lantern comics from that he got when he was a kid. And I think I remember being like, like I like barely knowing how to read and picking up one of those uh, those Green Lantern comics. Um, but the the show that I like really like attached to was the, like the CW's The Flash. Yeah, that was like the one character in the DC universe that like I I watched that show like religiously every week and. Um, it's my favorite, like, DC superhero. Um, but I, th- I think my first one was, was the Green Lantern, the comics for it. That's a very good choice. And and uh, with the the Flash as well, I mean, um, going back to, you know, early CW, Arrow and the Flash, that was, um, they were my interactions. And um, it, it's good to, good to know that other people um, were watching and enjoying them as much, um, especially as much as I did, because I was obsessed with them. So looking at voice acting again and um obviously where this is such an early kind of point for you um this film is full of a lot of really cool action scenes what was it like recording those scenes i i know it can be kind of like an isolating experience in booths um so what was it like trying to get into the action into the heart of it yeah that that was um that was a really fun part because for a lot of the action stuff, they got some, you know, um, any, any, any like specific sounds or words I needed to say, they got those. But then at the end, they got like a whole library of like varying levels of like efforts or yell when they need to. And then, um, you know, for like if, if they need me to come back for a second round of pickups, I can, you know, finish it off or grab whatever other other lines I needed. So that was a really cool, fun experience if you try that out. And looking uh, perhaps to the future, obviously this is, you know, part one. Um, do you think your experience voicing Superman will open up any other avenues for voice acting? Are there different characters, heroes, or even villains that you'd love to try out? Uh, hopefully. I, I, I can't comment on, on part two unfortunately but um but i i really hope this opens up avenues for um for voice acting and and hopefully in the dc universe be really really cool absolutely i yeah i would love to see you kind of tackle different characters especially knowing that you're an anime fan maybe there's an anime show out there that you can really get involved with and um yeah, I'm very, very excited for um, part two, and I really hope that people enjoy this kind of, kind of crazy combination of of two very different worlds. And kind of like to round off with, I was just wondering if you could tell us where we find uh, Superman. Uh, it was going to be my first question, but as as soon as you mentioned anime, I completely went off topic. Um, so where do we find Clark Kent? What's he up to? What what's Kind of, for, especially for new fans. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, Clark Kent, Superman. He's, um, you know, he's the audience's kind of first perspective on Ruby and the different realm remnants. And uh, as you're watching it, you kind of learn through his eyes and find all and all these questions about many of the baseline changes just to leave the world after, including that he's a major, how his powers have changed. Paired up with new teammates, and there's menacing Grimm as uh, you know their primary opponents. But he also has these vague, sporadic memories of his past that have brought them to London. So he's um, he's really the audience's kind of gateway into into this whole crazy, weird new world that has all these different rules and everything. So uh, it's it's a it's a cool ride. A massive thank you, as always, to Warner Brothers for setting up that interview for us. I know James had a really good time and uh, was really excited about chatting to Chandler about this, having watched the film just beforehand. Now, if you follow me on social media, uh, which you can, I'm at Neil Vag if you don't, you will know that I am currently in mourning. 
I am mourning the loss of Star Trek Picard, which completed its third and final season last week with an absolutely outstanding ending with final episode, The Last Generation. Whew. I don't want to say too much because I could talk for hours about it and uh, you can read all of my reviews of the individual episodes out there. I ended up giving five stars to every single episode this season. It is a five star season beyond that. But I just wanted to touch on it on an episode of this podcast because I feel like I've been talking about it everywhere else. And if you've not watched it, my God, what a season of TV it is. It is a huge testament to the writing abilities of that writer's room and to executive producer and showrunner Terry Metalis for pulling together what is genuinely a 10-hour movie. Even though individual episodes are structured in a way that they do, they do have a beginning, middle and end, the serialised story this season is just so brilliant. It runs amazingly across the course of 10 episodes. There are a couple of bits which run a little slow, and maybe you could suggest that it could have been shaved down into a movie, but given how the Next Generation characters left us with Nemesis, uh, it's just amazing that they were given this opportunity and actually every single bit of the season is worthwhile because it really is a love letter to all of those characters that style of storytelling and that whole 90s era on uh, sorry 90s and early noughties era of star trek from next generation through deep space nine through voyager and touching on enterprise as well the whole thing is just brilliant it's not the biggest budget that you're going to find out there you know this isn't a kind of in Game of Thrones style, super epic, but my God, do they use their budget to absolute maximum ability. The ships all look great. The space fights look great. The sets look absolutely stunning. Costume design is stunning. Everything about it is just so wonderful. It's maybe not an entry point into Star Trek if you've not watched The Next Generation, but if you have some familiarity with those characters, then it's just one of the most rewarding shows I think which has been on TV in the last 10 years and certainly as somebody who grew up with the next generation and has watched pretty much all Trek it's gonna be what goes down in history for me as one of my favorite seasons of all Star Trek it's so honestly I wept like a baby through several of the last episodes because it just touched on so many amazing points across these characters histories and the history and legacy of the franchise it's just it's unbelievable what they've been able to do with just a 10 episode season Uh, it i think all tv needs to learn from the kind of tight storytelling that we've got here the idea of a 22 episode season was something that i used to love but now i i really think that there is benefit to having shorter tighter more well-produced seasons and this is an absolutely prime example of it now we just have to hope that paramount is listening to fans who would love to see star trek legacy or whatever it would end up being called which would be a continuation it still kind of baffles me that after all these years there's never been stories in you know on tv or in film which follow on from that 90s and 90s era of tv we've had following voyager they went into prequel territory with enterprise then you had the kelvin timeline movies from jj abrams that retold the kirk spock story then you had discovery which is set between enterprise and the original series we have strange new worlds which is also you know set around before the time of the original series the only opportunities we've had on tv to tell stories set in the sort of quote-unquote present day of Star Trek, are Lower Decks, which is around the time of Star Trek Nemesis, and also Prodigy, which are obviously the two animated shows, but are both brilliant in their own right. There's so much storytelling to explore in a post-Dominion world, uh, Dominion War kind of landscape, and that's exactly what Terry managed to do and touch upon here, and I think it's really reignited fans' passion for Star Trek. I think Strange New Worlds ignited it to a certain degree. Discovery has brought in a wonderful new audience to Star Trek, as have both of the animated shows. But you can't deny 
the amount of impact that just 10 weeks of Picard has had by telling a very heavily space set, very Trek story in the same 25th century time period. So I sincerely hope that Paramount is listening and does more and announces it at San Diego Comic-Con when I'm there and can possibly pick up on it. <laughs> um, but if you've not seen it, then you can currently watch uh, all three seasons of Star Trek Picard in the UK on both Prime Video and Paramount+. Plus. We will absolutely circle back to this subject again when it comes out on home video, probably later this year. Uh, I think that's probably all I want to say about it for now. You can actually check out, uh, I've done two streams with the wonderful Luke Deckard on his YouTube channel if you search for him. Uh, I did a stream with him for episodes 7 and 8 and then 9 and 10. And even though that's only 4 hours of TV, we managed to clock up over 5 hours of streaming just shooting the shit about Star Trek. So go and check those out if you want to hear a bit more of my in-depth thoughts or you can read all of my reviews over on the website. This all leads me in nicely to uh, my final segment for this episode, which is things that I want to recommend you over the next couple of weeks that you should be watching, reading, listening to, etc, etc, etc. Obviously, I am recommending Star Trek Picard, which you need to watch if you've not already seen it. You should also listen to the series soundtrack they've just dropped Stephen Barton and Frederick Reedman's score for season three it's over two hours of really beautiful beautiful music which brings back some classic Star Trek themes but also has lots of new stuff in there as well and it is absolutely stunning if you want to give it a taster listen to the track Dominion it's my obsession at the moment I can't stop listening to it on loop so there's two recommendations for you. A uh, comic book that I would like you all to pick up and support is the first issue of DC Comics' Green Arrow. It hits comic book stores and digital platforms on the 25th of April. It's written by Joshua Williamson and has an artwork and cover by Sean Izaxe. Uh, interior and cover colours are by Romulo Fajardo Jr. and letters by Troy Pateri. The synopsis for the first issue, the Emerald Archer is lost and it will take Oliver Queen's whole family to find him. But dangerous forces are determined to keep them apart at any cost. Spinning out of Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, Green Arrow by DC architect Joshua Williamson and artist Sean Izaxe is an action-packed adventure across the DCU that sets the stage for major stories in 2023. I've got a four-star review of this, which will drop on the website on Tuesday as the book releases. I said, it's a strong but not perfect return for Oliver Queen. I'm excited to have Green Arrow back in comic book stores and keen to see just how far Williamson and his Axe are able to push this new high-concept story arc before they bring Oliver back down to Earth. It's a little busy. There are a lot of characters involved, but it is very worthwhile. If you are a fan of Green Arrow, Black Canary, Rory Harper, all of the characters that make up the kind of Arrow family, then this is going to be the perfect book for you because they are all there and it is brilliant. And last, but by no means least, a movie recommendation. This one is for the 18 plus out there, but if you are looking for something a little scary, a little creepy very atmospheric then please i implore you to go check out evil dead rise it's in cinemas now it was originally shot for hbo max so it would have been a streaming release but was upgraded to theatrical as part of the whole warner brothers discovery takeover and it is absolutely brilliant I gave it a cool four stars in my review, which you can check out over on the website, and I said Evil Dead Rise benefits greatly from a change of setting and tone to the earlier movies. Lee Cronin has crafted a genuinely terrifying and stomach-churning gore fest which is deserving of the Evil Dead name. It's so good. It uses so many practical makeup effects and stunt effects and practical just gore, and yet is still enhanced by the visual effects that were available to them as well, so it is the perfect mix kind of old and new tech to make a film which will have you on the edge of your seat and wanting to hide behind a pillow at all times so please 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 do go check it out while it's in the cinema because it's so so worth it and that's all for this episode we will be back with episode 91 in a couple of weeks we do need to talk about the final six episode of titans we were going to podcast about it as the review embargo lifted uh, but uh, Boy Wonder had some stuff going on with his PhD that was far more important than talking about Titans and actually we decided that we probably wanted to do a spoilery deep dive and sort of 
romanticize our feelings on four seasons of titans so we're going to circle back to it once the final episode is out in a few weeks so you have that to look forward to there might be some movies coming out in the coming weeks a guardians of the galaxy perhaps Possibly an Indiana Jones, a Transformers, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Flash. There is a lot because we are about to kick in to summer season. So ahead of San Diego Comic Con and the beginning of summer blockbuster season, I think we'll be giving you our picks for some of the biggest and best upcoming movies as and when we see them. But until then, please do stay safe, stay well, and I will see you very soon. Bye! (laughs)